This episode of What The Tech is brought to you by Jeremy Argyle. Everyone knows that the fit is the most important part of a men's shirt. Our friends at Jeremy Argyle have created the best fitting shirts in New York. Jeremy Argyle specializes in creating great fitting shirts with detail you just can't find in custom shirting. Voted best men's shirts by New York Magazine. Discover how shirts are supposed to fit. Go to jeremyargyle.com and get 10% off with coupon code WHATTHETECH. Everybody, welcome to What the Tech. I'm Andrew Zarin. Of course, I'm joined by Mr. Paul Thorat. How you doing, Paul? Pretty good. There we go. There we Beautiful. Beautiful. One day you're not going to say pretty good, and it's going to be the worst day ever. That was last week. It was last week. <laughs> How you doing? Uh, recovered from your trip? Recovered from everything? Just in time to go away again. Yeah. Yeah. You're coming back to New York uh, on Thursday, and then you may be in New York the following week. So you, uh, I maybe. cannot... You know what's funny? In all these years that we've done the show, I cannot remember you ever coming to New York this many times. Uh, in one, in like I guess even like one month, but in a year, you've you I think you've topped all your trips to New York, <laughs> right? Just in one month. Um, I should have flown to New York each time. I I would have gotten mosaic status on JetBlue by now. Yeah, why don't you? I hate flying to New York. Is it cheaper? Uh, no, probably not, but it's so convenient. It's, you know, the, the ability to, first of all, the the train station is a five minute drive from my house. Um, I can sit at a desk and get work done with internet and power. Uh, You can't compare these experiences. It's just so much better to take the train. I, I have not taken a train long distance ever. I just fly everywhere. (laughs) Okay. I would fly to Boston. Actually, if, when I come to Boston, should I fly or should I take the train? You think it makes more sense to take the train? I mean, I don't know for you. I just, you know, for me, it's... <laughs> take a boat. Take a boat, yeah. Yeah, just take a boat to uh, Boston. Um, you know, I, I want to I touch on last week. I want to reflect on some stuff that uh, has been happening in technology over the last two weeks. I think this is a very important time for uh, people who talk about tech to talk about tech. Uh, and the changes <laughs> yeah, that are happening... You mean like 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Yeah, like at 3 o'clock in the afternoon is the perfect time to talk about technology. <laughs> Uh, but before we do that, I want to thank a new sponsor to the network. I want to thank, uh, I want to welcome a new sponsor to the network, and that's Jeremy Argyle. Uh, I like, you know, people think I'm a t-shirt and jeans guy, which I am. 90% of the time, I'm in t-shirt and jeans. Most of the time, my t-shirts don't have sleeves. It's a, it's a fact. I just cut all the sleeves off my t-shirts. But I do have a lot of meetings in the city. Uh, Paul has seen me whenever I meet him. I, I try to make it into make it a trip to the city where it's kind of, you know, work and uh, and pleasure. Whenever I go into the city, I have to dress up. I have to wear a button down. I have to, you know, put on shoes and look like a person from society. Uh, but and, and the thing about this for me is I am very critical of clothing. I'm very critical of the things that I'm wearing. Uh, and Jeremy Argyle comes into play right here because whenever I buy a button down, it's the worst experience ever because my uh, my arms are short and I have a very short torso. So what happens is the shirts are down to my knees, even if they're fitted shirts. Uh, I just got a Jeremy Argyle shirt. They sent it to me to, you know, to talk about. It. I was like, ah, oh, it's going to be another button down. You know, I was a little worried that I'm going to be talking about these guys and it may not fit me right. But let me tell you, this thing was unbelievable. Uh, fit phenomenal. They do a great job at fitted shirts. Uh, nobody wants a shirt that's down to his knees. Uh, and it's overall quality and craftsmanship of the shirt that really sets it apart from a lot of those other, you know, you go to a, a retail store and, you know, it's, it's it, I'm not going to name names, but they sell button downs, they sell fitted shirts and you're compromising. You're going to compromise on the quality. Uh, it may look great the first time, but the one time you wash it, the first, one time you, you, you clean this thing and it's, it's falling apart. You could all, you could already feel, uh, everything just feeling weird it feels yucky to kind of use an educated term there jeremy argyle was voted the best men's shirt by new york magazine here's a little uh, little sample of everything that they have here uh, jeremy argyle.com you get 10 percent off if you use our coupon code what the tech at checkout and the thing that really makes them amazing is you can wear these shirts tucked in tucked out doesn't matter the stitching is great uh it's 
really uh, impressive. I wore this to a meeting the other day, and, and, I, and I felt comfortable in it. It was great. Uh, they also offer uh, sweaters, V-necks, hoodies, all different things on here. It's not just button downs. Uh, great time to purchase one. Uh, you could actually see here. Look at the stitching here. You see that? Looks really good. JeremyArgyle.com. Get 10% off with coupon code what the tech at checkout. I want to thank Jeremy Argyle for supporting the show for, and, of course, for supporting the GFG Network. Um, I wonder if they would let you in the Yale, uh, Yale suite. I know. With one of those. With one of these shirts. Would. You would see if you had your Jeremy Argyle, which we're supposed to send you one, uh, you would not have had this problem. Yeah. They would have looked at you and said, yes, right this way, sir. Right this way. Not very smart. And you, you don't have to tuck it in. You could tuck it in or tuck it out. It, it doesn't look ridiculous. It doesn't look like, I honestly, I look like I'm wearing my grandfather's like button downs as a child. I, I, I'm not, I'm not a tall man, Paul. Well. I'm 5'9", but I got, I got, I got a short. 5'9 is average. I got a short torso. Right. It's like I'm odd. It's, it's weird. It feels, it, it, all these things, I, it, it's just bizarre to me. I got I'm a, actually pretty tall, as you know, but I have short upper legs. You do have which, short upper which legs. Which I've only I've discovered it. because of Surface Pro 3. Because well, it's not lappable. <laughs> you can't put it on your lap? No. Oh, that's amazing. It's an embarrassment. Yeah, see? You know? I, we got to send you one of these shirts. And you got to walk around going, you got. You know what? You should go back. I'm like, can I come in here now? May, may, am I allowed breakfast? Right. Thanks, Jeremy Argyle, uh, for supporting the show. So let's, um, I want to I wanna reflect on a couple of things that we discussed here. Okay. Um. I want to I want to step back and talk about how the PC, uh, PC and technology has changed over the last decade. A lot of changes has, have happened, but there's also a lot of changes that have not happened. Mm. And it's astonishing to me that we are still doing some of the things that we do in computing and technology and hardware. Uh, one okay. thing that came to mind and the reason why I thought of this and I thought it might be an interesting discussion to have um, is one, the recent changes to the, what we consider a laptop. You know, the, right. the PC right. market has totally changed over the last, you know, couple months with these Surface type devices that I'm going to touch on. But Apple announced their new IMAX today. Yeah. And the thing that shocked me was... <laughs> the shocked you? Shocked me. The fact that, yep. it, the fact that it comes with a 5,400 RPM uh, hard drive. And Brad tweeted this. And he yeah, did it yeah, as yeah. a joke. But you know what? I, I thought he was just no, it's joking. it's not a joke. It's that's, not a joke. Well, that's crazy. Why? I th why is it crazy? No, I understand why it's crazy, but why I it's astonishing to me considering, you know, yeah. Apple's a premium brand and everything's about speed and you want the overall best experience and an SSD is not going to kill you. It's not going to put your price point up tremendously. Why is this right. thing coming with a 5400 RPM hard drive <laughs> that is I, that, that you don't even see that often well, okay. in lower I mean, end I, devices? By the way, anymore. I'm not defending this. OK, yeah. I, I'm not defending this, but I, I guess what I would guess is that. The 5400 RPM uh, SKU or version, whatever, is the iMac version of the 16 gig iPhone, right? No one should ever get that. That yeah. is ludicrous. It's crazy. But you know but, what? They're not the only ones doing this. I I'm bringing okay. Apple up because they are a premium. Well, yeah, you know? th that's why. <laughs> right. So I, 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 is there another premium PC version that has a 5400 RPM hard drive? I mean, who even uses hard drives? I'm trying to think who's putting hard drives in the. I mean, I mean, I think a lot of a lot of the PC manufacturers are putting in hard drives. No, but not 5400 RPM. Not 5400, 7200 for and sure. And not as the only disc. That's yeah, crazy. Um, I I was I was just stunned when I saw this because you can't get a regular hard drive in their laptops anymore. They all right. have. They're all SSDs now. I I, I it's you know what Paul is borderline criminal. To give someone this 5400 RPM hard drive, and and you have all these specs, I, I I just I was stunned that to see that this is still something that's available on uh, on a Mac. And I uh, I was too, but uh, you know, okay, so we're gonna make fun of the uh, the hard drive because it's we should it's ludicrous. But actually, I'm not gonna write about this because it would just be seen as one of those kind of Apple baiting articles, which is really not what I'm about. But I do find it incredibly odd in 2015. From the company that has embraced mobile touch, uh, multi-touch or mobile devices, and fingerprint one-touch access to signing in, yeah. that their premium desktop computers do not offer these very basic features. That's crazy, and you can make a whole argument about you know their decision that macOS is never going to have 
touch for whatever, you know, for whatever arbitrary baloney reason. But that the finger like touch ID, are you kidding me? You they just released new uh keyboards and 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 uh trackpads and stuff that you don't have a freaking touch ID on that. That's ridiculous. Yeah, why is that? Do you know why they did that? I, no. I mean, we just wasn't. No. Is it, is it because something? Apple? I mean, they clearly do not care as much about this stuff. Yeah, the they PC clearly is not, do not. Yeah, you know, they just don't. I mean, the fact that they put this out now is is interesting to me. But I'm looking at the pricing here. It's two hundred dollars more for flash storage. Two hundred. Two hundred bucks more. Well, I mean, okay, but you understand this is a a way for them to pretend that they have a. a a lower entry price on this device, you know? I mean, honestly, I, I guess, you know, we, we've talked a lot about retina class displays, meaning uh, retina class display, meaning not to use Apple marketing terms, but rather because High at rise, a normal yeah. distance, which for a desktop computer might be what, about 20, 24 inches or whatever, you can't see individual pixels. That's what that means. Um, I think a retina class display makes a lot more sense on a desktop computer than it does on a laptop or phone because you don't have the battery life issues that accompany that kind of thing. Um, and that's fine, but really, you know, when, when all you're focused on is how something looks, this is the age old argument about against Apple, the argument that you can't make against its mobile devices, which is that they only care about form over function. And this is the thing I always couldn't stand about Apple and that they still do it on the Mac is very frustrating to me because it seems to me like they would want people to adopt the Mac, you know, because it's a much it's a it's a very high margin business. You know why not? It is a tr it's a it tremendous more, high margin more business. To it. it doesn't make sense. Yeah, I, I and it's not we're not only talking about the 21 uh the smaller I you know iMac. No, no, no we're talking about the, the 20 we're, talk, we're talking the whole line. That thing starts at what 17.99 which uh, I I think which is wait, an wait, unbelievable wait. amount of money. Yeah, 17.99. No, right. I'm sorry. The, I'm sorry. Hold on. 27 inch iMac. Yep. Uh, yeah, seventeen ninety nine. Yep. But does that mean the real starting price is nineteen ninety nine? Because that's what you have to spend to get an SSD. Let's see. What do I spend to get? An I SSD? think is that what it means. I mean, I think well, that's what I, it means. So what? I look. I haven't here. been sitting on Apple site configuring. Yeah. So Max so all day. On, on the twenty seven inch, right? Starts yeah. off with a one terabyte seventy two hundred RPM. On the twenty seven. Oh, <laughs> Isn't that nice? Yeah. Oh, and then nice. for a hundred dollars more, you get that fusion drive. How much more? Hundred bucks more. You get a one terabyte fusion All right. drive. That's, All right. right. That's reasonable. Okay. So two thousand bucks we're talking. Nine or eighteen. But if you want if you want a two fifty six, you're gonna pay two hundred dollars more. Okay. It's an expensive computer. It is. I mean, I you know, a desktop again, I can't I, in other words, what I'm not gonna say is something like for two hundred bucks less or for you know, for fifteen hundred bucks or something, how about like a full HD version of this computer? You know, I'm not gonna say that. I I I do think, especially in a Mac where you don't have as many issues with display scaling, uh the pixels you know, matter. I think that does matter to people, but it really it, it amazes me, uh A, you know, they've been milking this iMac design for forever, you know, uh, as they have done with the MacBook Air. They really drag those things out. And I mean, it's a beautiful design. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's fine. You know, it's fine. I, I actually think that lamp thing they made was prettier, but whatever. I, I just don't, I just can't, I don't know. I don't explain. Like, I, I feel like with the iPhone in particular and to a lesser degree, maybe the iPad, um, they've kind of won me over. Like these are good products. Yeah. Uh, the iMac, it's a good looking machine. I don't like Mac OS 10. That's just my thing. I know some people are fine with it. Um, I just don't see the value in a two thousand dollar computer that's not compatible with anything. Like, okay, I just so, don't understand what the point of so it. So this kind of like for me, I still think that the MacBook Pro is the one of the best looking laptops on the market. Overall package, um, yeah, you're gonna mm -hmm. pay you're gonna pay a premium for it a little by a couple hundred bucks. I think the PC manufacturers are now smarting up a little bit and they're realizing that they can they could charge more for these things. Uh, because I, I I've been pricing out you know these you know higher end higher end ultra books you know like the mac i don't want to i hate calling it a mac clone but do you know what i mean like uh, something that's compatible with the macbook pro and mm -hmm. we're not we're not talking that much cheaper we're not talking hundreds of dollars cheaper in some cases it's as expensive or maybe 100 or 150 dollars less than a macbook pro um well yeah but by by definition when you're talking about a computer that's going to compete with macbook pro yeah it, this is a premium computer i mean this yeah. is a very you know high end and we over the last week, I've been hearing a lot of criticism over the price of 
the Surface Book. And I understand that. Okay, fine. Let's let's criticize it a little bit based on the price. It's very expensive. But it's a tablet. Fine. Forget about the tablet feature. Forget about all that. Okay. This is this is this is a really good example of what happens when you don't have crapware subsidizing the cost of the PC. Well, okay, hold on. <laughs> so, um in the in the market for computers that cost over $1000 or certainly in the $1500 range. Um uh, you actually don't see a lot of crapware in this market, right? And so we're talking about ThinkPad, like X1 Carbon type devices. Um, you know the uh, the uh, the HP Envy. I'm sorry, the HP Spectre X360 probably starts at eight nine hundred bucks, but you could buy one that costs fifteen hundred dollars. There's no real crapware on there. It, it does come with like a McAfee kind of thing or whatever. Um, the crapware is going to be on the low end PCs, which by the way make up the bulk of the PC market by far. You know, uh, in an interview with Terry Morrison, there was a quote that. Only one percent of PCs cost fifteen hundred dollars or more. What was that? What? Uh, you, what? What? One percent. One percent. Okay. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's not. You know, it's funny when you think about Apple emulating. I'm sorry. When you think about Microsoft emulating Apple, which you know they've certainly done, and Apple does it back and forth as well. Um, this is an interesting thing for them to kind of copy, right? Um, not just make really nice Apple-like devices, but price them accordingly as well, right? Um, they're not really competing against high volume PCs here, which I think is part of the point. Well, yeah, um, but do you, you know? do you think they're competing? With, do you think they're you know copying Apple? I don't see them as copying Apple, but kind of setting an, uh, I, and and copying the, Apple has connotations which many people will find negative. Yeah, I, do I, I think I that they are adopting the same strategy as Apple and going after the premium part of the PC market with this device. Yes, they, absolutely, absolutely yeah. of course they are. Yep. But they're also they're also not competing with their OEMs, and they're not upsetting their No, but that's the point. OEMs. That's yeah. what I mean. Um, Surface was really – well, the, Surface has a kind of a convoluted history, but the, a, a big part of it was the PC makers weren't making the devices that Microsoft thought would best show off at the time Windows 8, and so they did it. Now, of course, uh, as you've seen, you know there are things that look exactly like Surface to different degrees, and now Microsoft is – you know, Panos Panace is something uh, – I was re, you know inventing a new market or you know going into a, new, a different direction, um, and but it's a direction that was pioneered by Apple and has met with great success by Apple, right? And so Apple, for all of its success, still only controls about seven percent of the PC market worldwide, but it's also the most lucrative seven percent. And yeah. you can understand why Microsoft, even if Microsoft only snags one two percent of the PC market with these devices, uh, it's a fairly lucrative market. Sure. Fifteen hundred bucks a pop and up. We spend three grand on one of these things. Yeah. So you know the 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 argument here is why why would the PC market want to copy something that is that is a market failure with only seven percent? Well, because well, well no, but it's not it's it's a profitable because uh, raw numbers don't, aren't the only metric that matters. Yeah. I mean, um, profitability matters. Um, as, by the way, for Microsoft, uh, and I had written extensive articles about this in, as Windows Eight was being released, and in the wake of Windows Eight, I used to get a lot of market share data uh, from people at Microsoft to prove these points. Um, the PC makers had killed the PC market with their netbooks first and then with low-cost you know, Windows computers. And Microsoft really helped them continue doing that throughout the Windows 8 through Windows 8.1 because they had no other choice. That if they didn't give away Windows for free or give it away for next to nothing, uh, PC makers would not be able to afford to make devices. And they, of course, what they responded, but you know, they made cheap devices. And so the, the problem is you don't want Windows to be associated with the cheap plastic crap. You know, it's, we don't... We don't want to be the dollar store, you know. Yeah. You've got like, um, you know, you have the dollar store and like a strip mall, and then there's like a William Sonoma next door. Then that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, Apple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, uh, Microsoft wants to be more like William Sonoma, yeah. and so I think what Microsoft wants to do overall is not so much sell a lot of these computers. By the way, I think a lot of people misunderstand this, but I, I think what they want is for people to aspire to that device, and then say, you know, ultimately. I, I spec this thing out and it's fifteen hundred bucks or maybe it's two thousand, twenty two hundred bucks, whatever it is. It's too much. But maybe this time I'll spend eight hundred dollars and I'll get a Dell or an HP or a Lenovo instead, and it will have much of the features that I'm seeing on this really high end surface. And now you're not what you're not doing is spending two hundred bucks on some cheap piece of plastic. You know, I think that's I honestly I really do think that's the point. Because the the trouble with pricing is once you've gone down market. You can't ever really come back. Yeah. You know, you can't sell a Kia, you know. Well, uh, they are for, doing for, it. Well, I, I know. I was just thinking the same thing. Well, no, you can't sell the same Kia 
for nine, no, nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars, and yeah. then the next year sell it for seventeen thousand nine hundred ninety nine. You can't do that. Yeah. You, but you can make an upscale Kia, and then you have a little battle to fight because people, you know, they look at uh, brands like um, you know Hyundai or Kia, which are, I think are really the same thing, and they they think cheap Korean crap. You know, it what ha- what has to happen is good reviews. Good word of mouth. Someone will take a chance and buy. I bought one because I didn't have a lot of money. And holy crap, this thing's really nice. Yeah. So this is like as nice as a, you know, a, a Lexus or something that costs three times as much. Yeah, I mean, and that's it, what it Microsoft is trying to do. It, it takes time, and, it, and it's not something that's going to happen overnight. I think Microsoft creating their own premium brand for computers. Uh, not only, but not only what are they, you know, creating a premium brand and selling hardware. They're also going to have the OEMs follow in their in their footsteps. Just like a car manufacturer, Mercedes implements something, and guess what? A year or two later, you see it in a Kia. Yeah. Everybody has a touchscreen navigation now. Everybody, you know, it it, it trickles down. Uh, for Microsoft, however, I do think that I I do think that this is a real positive because this is making their brand look stronger. You know how many people I know that tell me that Windows sucks because they had a Windows machine ten years ago and it was blue screen all the time. Right. Is it Windows right. or is it the hardware you're running? Oh, I, I've told it's, you the story. The, I, I, uh, uh, the wife of a friend will remind me on a fairly regular basis. You know, the reason I use a Mac is because it's so much better than a PC. It's so much more reliable. You know, blah blah blah. And I'm like, what well, was the last time you used a PC? And she's like, I don't know, 2001, 2002. Then your opinion is meaningless. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know. Um, and listen, I mean, I I use a PC and I use a Mac every day, every single day. I'm using both. Uh, yeah. I. You know why I use a Mac? I, I I've, I've said it a thousand times. I like the trackpad. I like yep. how the I like how the machine works, and I got used to OS ten. Uh, it, it's it, they, but there is no difference for me. I don't use so, it because okay. I think that it's better than Windows yeah. ten. I use it because that's what's on here. If sure. if I could if I could someone came to me and said, you know what, Andrew, this laptop here is a Windows based laptop. You will absolutely love this thing, and it's great. <laughs> you know what? I, I, I think- would probably use that. The the thing is, you know, most people don't have. I don't want to call this a luxury because honestly, it's it's its own kind of a chore. But uh, this is uh, not so much PCs because this wouldn't really happen on the PC. But with phones, right? You know that recently I uh, used for several weeks um, a, a Motorola uh, a Motorola X, right? Yeah, it's a, great, yeah, a yeah, Moto yeah. X, a Moto X smartphone, yeah. Android, the new one, right? The brand new one. I used the iPhone six S Plus um, over the weekend. I switched back to my Lumia nine thirty. I was expecting at the Microsoft event last week to get the new one of the new Lumias at least or both of them preferably so I could review them. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. It's, it will happen eventually, but they're you know those things are delayed. Um, and it's interesting going back and forth between these three things because each of them has things that I really like and each of them has things I kind of can't stand. You know, and on Windows Phone for example. It was interesting going back to the Lumia because it was sort of comfortable for me. It's the platform I prefer. I like the way it looks the most. I'll, you know, camera's great and all that stuff. And we're out. I'm out with my wife and I'm taking some pictures, and I want to post them on Facebook. And then I'm reminded, right, the Facebook app on Windows Phone is completely broken. It's completely yeah. broken. It it is the it slowest piece of garbage ever. It's awful. And you know what? I, it's not really fair to judge a platform by a single app, but when it's something you use a lot. It really gets in the way. It's it's a huge problem, and um, you know. And of course, iOS has whatever. But I guess the point is, these things all have issues. You know, if you were Mac versus OS ten, whatever, you can point to different things in either one where you're like, this is not ideal. This is not optimal. This is you know, I wish this was different. Yeah. Um, you basically just pick one and you use it, and that's true whether it's a PC or a Mac or any kind of a phone. And then you just become used to it. Like you said, I think the way you, you know you just said. Not so much like I love OS ten. You're like I, I'm used to it now. I just got used to it. Yeah, and I think that's the way life works. I, it's not. Well, it's like switching browsers. I mean, the, yeah. The, I remember the first time I went from you know Firefox to Chrome. It was yep. a pain in the butt. Or even going from like IE to to Firefox. It was a pain in the pain in the ass because you, it was different. Right. You, you have know what's to not rethink. a pain in the ass anymore. What doing what you just described? Yeah. I just did it this week. Did I you? had um, a beta version of Windows ten, a leaked version. Um, which I upgraded to on my desktop, and now Chrome crashed all the time. And it was the type of thing we'd click in a, bra- in a tab, it would kind of freeze up. It would come back eventually, but I mean seven minutes later eventually. I struggled with this for about a day and a half. Then I uninstalled it, and I was going to reinstall it, and I was like, let me see if, did I install Firefox in this thing? I did. 
I had gone to the um, trouble in the past to make sure that that favorite stool bar had all the same favorites in it in both browsers. Yeah. Passwords are saved in both browsers. And I, a lot, I, I just, I'm just using Firefox. I'm using Firefox now. I'll just use Firefox. It doesn't matter. It works fine. Yes. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, and at some point I'll blow away the computer and, you know, I'm running beta below. You'll go back it, to but, Chrome. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't it, matter. It doesn't matter. It all but, works fine. But it comes down to just allowing yourself some time to kind yeah. of adjust yeah. uh, and, and understand, you know, what's happening. Uh, did I, Listen, if I didn't give if the second I picked this Mac up when I when I first got it, uh, the one prior to this, I got my first Mac. I got like two thousand ton. I I was like, what the hell's going on here? Where's right click? You know, where where how do I start? Where's right click? Yeah. yeah, where's right? Yeah. Like, what am I doing? But I, I allowed I allowed myself, you know, a couple weeks of using this exclusively to understand and learn the platform. If you don't do that with anything, it's going to be a bad experience. That's why I use an Android phone and I have an iPad and, uh, you know, hopefully I'll get a Windows phone. Which I have a Windows phone. I mean, I use the experience. It comes down to what you're comfortable with. Yeah. I mean, yep. I don't, I, I think it's like the whole notion that, well, you know, Apple's a better product and that's why people use Apple. No, Apple's what you're used to. Right. right. The operating system is what you're used to. Unless you are... I mean, you're doing some stuff in terminal, and you know and that that there. <laughs> what if you are? Let's face it. What if you are? I mean, I use your terminal, opinion is not really very interesting. But you know, unless you have a very specific reason why the Mac platform is better than the Windows platform, but you you are an exception. Most people don't even know what no, they're I, looking at. I know at. that. I, mean, I know I, someone no, I that, that keeps calling. I swear to you, Paul. I have a relative who has a MacBook Pro, and she called me and asked me when she should do her Windows 10 update. She thought she's running Windows. She has no idea. Sure. How does she know? She has no idea what the, what it's called, what the operating system is. She got a Mac. She's like, when do I do my Windows 10 update? And I go, oh, what computer did you buy? He goes, I have the Mac. People don't don't know and don't care. It's what they're using and what they get used to. Yeah. Uh, well, but, I mean, obviously, you're talking normal people. Normal I mean, people. The, the people listening to this. But not the, the people listening. People who read my website are probably more enthusiastic about technology. I too, and, yeah. And have very hard opinions. But I, you do hear a lot of these kind of throwaway lines, you know, like, I'll never buy anything from Apple. This stuff's so expensive, you know. And and the people who buy Apple will sort of tell you that, um, you know, I don't mind paying extra because I feel like there's a lot of value to this thing. And and I, I kind of see both sides of it. Um, you know, we'll see how Microsoft does on the Surface book in particular because this is really the uh, the stratosphere of the uh, the pc yeah. market as far as price i don't know i well, don't know Paul, if I think about i'll tell you the whole the whole uh myth about max lasting longer i'm gonna tell you i i've had this since 2011 and it's running perfectly fine to, for me i haven't upgraded my laptop since 2011 so yeah it, there maybe there's some truth to that but it, would i be satisfied if i bought you know a premium two thousand dollar pc i'm sure i would have probably had a very similar experience because I bought higher end pro a higher end product with higher end components and faster chipsets, so is it is it the computer that I bought or is it the components that I'm using that are you know faster than what I would have bought if I spent six seven hundred dollars? I think that's the comparison that we need to draw here. Yeah, you know you're you're paying for. You know, I th I think you said it once. You go, you know, you could go buy a Mercedes that has three hundred horsepower and all the all the bells bells and whistles, or you could go and buy a Kia that has yeah. three hundred horsepower and has some of well, it. Are yes, you going to twenty seven horsepower? Yeah, but and, and you're spending and you're spending, you know, <laughs> yeah. much less. Yeah. But are they'll both you, get you there? They'll both get right? you there. You're going to be able yep. to do the same thing at the end of the day. Uh, is right. are people going and saying, well, Mercedes Benzes or you know, a Mercedes is a scam? And it's way too overpriced. <laughs> I, you don't hear that because we've well, conditioned in our minds that, well, this is, you know, you spend a little bit more money, you're getting a little bit more. I don't know. I think it's a lot of, a lot of you know, what, what side you're on with this. But yeah. this segues into what I wanted to talk about. And, you know, and you brought it up about Apple, you know, having this special factor, you know, they're, they're pretty sure. and they're better. Has that okay. gone away? Has, has the coming. idea that Apple is special, what makes Apple special, has has a turn has a tide turned in that sense that now everybody is making a MacBook? Um, well, I mean, I no. I mean, I think everyone has been making a MacBook for many years, and not many of them have done well. In fact, uh, HP for years pushed their own baloney versions of MacBooks on 
the public and, and they were very clearly rip off designs and I didn't think too highly of them for that reason. Um, but yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I don't, I don't, what do we, do we feel that there's some computer that's a rip off of the MacBook still? Are we still, uh, what do you mean? I know. I don't think this is a thing. I mean, not really. No, it, it's my point. It's not that we're, they're cloning it, but in that in yeah. that fact, right? That that the competitor, the MacBook Pro competitor, for years the competitor was a clone. Now there are PCs out there that are way prettier and way better looking than a MacBook Pro. Um, you know, I, I'm looking at some of these. You know, yesterday I was pricing out some computers, and I'm like, wow, that that's a beautiful machine. That's a beautiful machine. That's a beautiful machine. Uh, it, there's nothing that makes the Mac better aesthetically. And I think for a long time that okay. was that <laughs> I was. Know. I mean, it has an Apple logo on it. The lights up. I mean, I, I guess so, I right? actually think one of the big things Microsoft missed on the Surface Book is that the Microsoft logo doesn't light up when you open it. You know, it's oh, just, just a there. reflecting. Uh, well, it's a reflection, you know, kind of thing like. A, I don't know. I I just feel that when you well when you're okay. comparing the two when you when you look at the PC market, I, <laughs> the problem with the PC market was that the mis the 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 idea was that they were lower end and Macs were special and they were very expensive. That's why there were. That's I, why I don't you think paid any, a premium. No computer maker that has made a MacBook Pro class computer has ever met with great success. The possible exception, possible exception, might be Lenovo with ThinkPad X1 yeah. Carbon. Those things look nothing like a MacBook. So, but they, they're a competitor. They're they're they they're competing in that class. Yes. Yeah. I, I guess my point is they didn't completely rip off Apple. No. So, no. 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 And, and my point is that when we're talking about the market that they're competing in. Andrew, what is your point? <laughs> my point is... <laughs> Andrew, get to the point. My point is that it, it's not... When when you're in that price range, you have yeah. options now. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, that's a different... Well, yeah. you've always had a couple of options. Like, for example, um, I guess it was three years ago, I bought a 15-inch a Samsung Ultrabook, which I talk about all the time. I still love this thing. It's really out of date. It's got to be three, four processor gens out of date. Uh, it has a really low res screen, sixteen hundred by nine hundred, which, by the way, I actually kind of love because uh, there are no scaling issues yeah. in Windows. Um, that, th if you were to buy that device today, obviously it would have a super high res screen. It looks almost identical. Um, it's probably somewhere in the two thousand to twenty two hundred dollar range. It's a lot of money. Which you know? model is this? Uh, it's it, it's a Samsung Series Nine. If they yeah, still okay, call yeah, it that, uh, yeah, the, yeah. Actually, they might call it a, a Samsung Book. Nine or something, you know, they've changed the name a little bit or whatever it is. But, um, you know, Asus makes a, a 13 inch and possibly a 15 inch like this. Um, there are these expensive devices, like they've been around, but they've always been kind of uh, niche devices. Like, uh, you don't really see these things out in the world. You know, when I get on a train or whatever, I see a lot of Dells, a lot of ThinkPads, uh, some HPs and things like that. I don't really see Samsung, you know, anything, uh, as far as computers go. Um, yeah, Series 9, the Ative Book 9. AT, that, that's it, the Ative uh, yeah. Book 9. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's, so that's probably the new version of the um, the thing I ha have, still have. But um, And you can spend, actually, I'm looking now, there, I guess there are versions that are not that expensive, but oh, because they're Core M, so uh, that might not be the same one. No, these things are like $2,000. I'm not sure if it's the right SKU. No, I'm looking at the no, right uh, version. This is an i7. Yeah, so you can get like a 13-inch version for 1700 bucks. Yeah. And I bet the 15 inch is 2000. Yeah. You know, whatever. So you're competing. Something. I mean, it's, it's competing in that price range. It is. Well, yeah. it's selling in that price range. I mean, I'm not sure it's competing. That's the thing. I mean, I don't think they, they sell very many of these things. Okay. So are um, they not selling many because the PC market just people don't yeah, look at it? just doesn't spend, support it. It doesn't support it. In other it. words, when people, people go PC for a lot of reasons, but it's a perfectly valid reason, just like you would buy, not, not that anyone on earth would ever choose a Kia over a Mercedes. Those are not. The same products, but you might make a choice like uh, an Audi over a Mercedes, and maybe the Audi is twenty five grand, and the, the equivalent Mercedes is thirty five grand. I mean, that's probably not super accurate. Um, you might go down to even like a Volkswagen, although <laughs> probably not today. But you know, where you might have like a Volkswagen Passat, which has enough of the stuff that's kind of nice about it that you're like, okay, I could save a significant amount of money uh, getting this vehicle over like a Mercedes C Class or whatever. Um, in the PC business, though, it's not like that. It, the PC, by and large, to the public, it is Kias and Hyundai's and low-end 
things. And I, and I, I just think it's a tough sell with rare exceptions. The ThinkPad high-end, you know, X-Class uh, ThinkPad is in that market. And really not much else. Um, even like the really nice HPs, um, you know, they have the Spectre X360, which I really like. Starts at under $1,000. Um, they have some business class computers, uh, the Folio, which is probably $1,200, 1500 yeah. But, you know, or could be. I mean, if you, you know, you could spend enough on it if you wanted to. But I don't think that's like the volume market for any yeah. PC maker. It really isn't. Yeah, I guess I guess they're making it just to have it, just to support it. I, the hope is always that you can get customers to move up scale. I, I think just by having these things in the lineup, um, you, you'll cause customers to spend a little more than they might have otherwise, right? Because when you're selling a, a you know, Lenovo sells a $200, 11-inch um, Windows 10 PC. Uh, I don't know what it's called. An IdeaPad 200, I think is the name of it. It's $200. They also sell a $2,000 ThinkPad X1 <laughs> Carbon. In between those are a lot of computers. And if Lenovo's computers only went from $200 to $1,000, people might spend an average of $500. But if the, if the computers go from $200 to $2,000, well, maybe now they're spending an average of $800. Yeah. And it kind of benefits the entire line to have aspirational class devices where people are like, okay, I really can't afford that. I'd love that. But look, if I just go up one model, I get this one feature that's on that high-end one, and that makes it worth it to me, and I'm going to do it. Yeah. You know, so, I think this is the strategy. So do you... I'm curious to see how that translates. Like over the next couple of purchases, do you slowly keep going up? Yeah. Do you keep buying, you know, I, a higher model and a little bit of a higher model, a little yeah, bit of a higher yeah. model? I'd love to see that. I'm on Lenovo's know. website right now, but this thing is a Turkish bazaar. I have no idea what's happening. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's a mess. Yep, There's like five thousand laptops. I don't know what is what. I don't know. The problem. Yeah. So Lenovo suffers from the same problem that actually car makers do, like BMW, Mercedes. We talk about this a lot. Too many different kinds of things. And uh, on Lenovo's site, they have um, Lenovo machines. They have IdeaPads. They have ThinkPads. You know, they they have too much different. They stuff. They got a G and, series, a Y yep. series, a sure. Z series, yep. and then they got touch versions of everything. Oh, yeah. The Y40 to the Y80. Let's think about that. They got the Y40 to the Y80. Then they have the Y50 UHD, and then they got the Y50 Touch. And you know what? I'm looking here. Everything is a couple grand. Couple grand, couple grand, nine hundred. Man, that's not bad. I don't that's know. I don't nice know stuff. what. I mean, so, you know. I, where do you see the PC market going now that? Well, Microsoft <laughs> is creating hardware. Oh, I, I should add. I mean, uh, you know, one of the other issues, and this is, relates to what you just asked, is you know, obviously the PC market is going to be smaller than it was, right? We used to. We've been talking for many years now about three hundred million PCs a year, three hundred million, three hundred million. It's not three hundred million. It's eh, two seventy five, two sixty. It's it's going down. In such a market, it would behoove everybody to move the average selling price of these machines up a notch, right? I mean, we can't keep selling fewer two hundred dollar computers. We need to see we need to sell fewer eight hundred dollar computers, and I think that's the part of the goal. I think that's where you see the market going. There will always be these cheap devices, you know, um, but there are some advantages to higher end devices, more expensive devices, and hopefully some of those advantages include they last longer, you know, yeah, that they're viable for a longer amount of time. Are the Surface Books sold out? Yeah, that's what I'm seeing online. That that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, well, what does sellout mean? What you, yeah, what does sellout that? mean when you made twenty? Yeah, right, right. Well, we don't know how much they made, but yeah. Right. I'm curious on what the volume is. I, I I doubt that they'll announce it. But they always do this. It, yeah. it, it's stupid to do that. You should just keep. What you do is you push back the delivery date. You know, that's what Apple does. You don't sell out. You can't sell out of something you can keep making. You, you, there's no such thing as a sellout. There's just an amount of time that goes by before you actually get to make them. And they uh, sold that on I, a pre-order, too. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I don't know. I, I, I think this is a great example that they've set for the OEM world, of the, the PC world, where, listen, if you want to create a premium laptop, this is what you, we want you to make. This is This is the computer we want you guys to make. And it seems like, People are listening because I, I'm stunned that every day there is a new Surface-style laptop out there. Toshiba now announced their line, and it's all Surface-style laptops. Yeah. You know, Acer, Acer has it. Asus has it. Dell announced theirs, and I actually like the Dell one. The Lenovo one is the best one, in my opinion, out of the knockoffs because it has that gold hinge. But, I mean, you look at this thing, and you're saying, okay, well, this is a Surface. So it's... <laughs> 
it's well, all, it, it, <laughs> sure. You know what I mean? Like, like, okay, let's let's put it, okay, hold on a second. So, um, uh, there have been laptops for a long time, and I'm not, I, and I, I'm not necessarily buying into this sort of version of the mythology. But let's just pretend that Apple invented this really thin and light kind of computer, and they called it a MacBook Air, and that PC makers looked at this, and then they started making MacBook Air knockoffs. And Intel created a spec that they called Ultrabook, and in order to spec uh, to get the Ultrabook label, you had to, you know, your machine had to meet certain things that made sure it was thin and light and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you agree that an Ultrabook is just some super thin and light kind of a deal, and that it has to meet certain, you know, processor, battery life, whatever specifications, there's only so much ways you can make one of these things make because it's thing, always yeah. going to be thin and light and whatever. Um, a MacBook, uh, a 2015 MacBook which only has two, or, no, I'm sorry, actually, I believe it only has one USB-C port on it. Mm -hmm. It's still sort of qualified. It's sort of, a, it's basically an book. It just has fewer ports. Um, it's sort of stretching the definition of that thing, you know, whatever. Um, I think we can all agree the MacBook Air was a successful device. And so it shouldn't surprise us that PC makers have been, let's say, inspired by this design and have made their own. And now we have books everywhere. This, everyone has books, and they're pretty great. Most of them are pretty great. Um, that's not a bad thing. And so if we're going to give Apple that credit, let's give Microsoft a bit of credit too because when Windows 8 came out, they invented this Surface thing, right, which is basically a tablet that can turn into a laptop. And um, now we're seeing – now they've seen some success. They, they, I think they got it right with Surface Pro 3 finally. They, they went up on the screen primarily, went down on the thickness, let's say. And now you're starting to see a lot of designs from PC makers that are – either very much like Surface Pro, which I think can be a little embarrassing, like what Lenovo did, or they can be somewhat like Surface Pro, but the, the same type of machine. In other words, you get it, it's a tablet, so the top's going to be thicker. It's going to have a, a, a keyboard that is a cover, right? It's going to look like a Surface. Like, I'm not going to... I, I, it's, it's sort of amusing that they're so... You know, some of them are copying it pretty obviously. But I think this... what the, Apple is copying it. Apple made a is making an iPad computer that has a keyboard cover. Yeah, you know it is a Surface Pro ripoff, just as much as this other stuff. It doesn't matter. I know it runs iOS. People love to make these distinctions like they mean anything. Like God forbid Apple use its most popular operating system on a device they want to succeed. I mean, of course they're going to do that. So, to me, this is all this says is Microsoft has just invented a category, just like Apple did with Ultrabooks. Absolutely, and you know? I think the category. I think from if. Well, maybe you would maybe know. It, it, does Microsoft see this as a negative that the industry is copying them? Or do they see this as a positive where this is what we wanted them to do and now they're doing it? So, okay. I've not heard internally yet what Microsoft really thinks about this. The public line is exactly what you think it would be. They're very happy that PC makers have, you know, uh, formalized their design and, you know, they've all kind of rallied around it and this had, this is the impact they wanted to have on the market and yada, yada, yada. I mean, do I think there is anyone at, at Surface who's a little burned by some of the devices that are maybe a little too close to what Surface has done? Yeah, probably there are those guys. But there's still some animosity between the PC makers and Microsoft because of Surface. And I think that um, Microsoft can't complain now because they already pissed everyone off, you know. And yeah. if some of these guys want to come back and just copy them, I don't think they can say anything about it. And, and they wouldn't. They're, they're partners, you know. It just it, That's the market. Uh, we're, we're going in that direction. Um, you know, the biggest... Yeah. I, and I, I think it would be ridiculous for them to complain over because that's this is what they wanted the partners to do. They it, wanted by to the way, build if, these if devices. Surface is, is as successful as it can be, it almost has to cease to exist. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, there should be no reason for Microsoft to make its own hardware. Um, that's probably not, <laughs> you know, the way it's going to go. Well, Windows but, eight, Windows eight is a great example on why they had to. They had to start making their own hardware because, well, they didn't have to. I mean, I, I, I guess they, they had, t they had kind of put up with this situation for a long time with PC makers. You know, if you go back to each Windows release in turn. PC makers were not shipping the devices that Microsoft wanted them to ship. The problem with Windows 8 is that it was such a dramatic departure that it made it worse. You know, you make a system that works best on touch devices, especially tablets, and PC makers are just pumping out the same garbage laptop yeah. from last year with no touch. With no touch, and they're just and putting it's like, it over, guys, yeah. seriously. And it, it, it's a problem because PC makers have always done this. Remember um, when the Media Center PC debuted, the first computer out of the gate 
was an HP. In fact, it was the only one at launch. It was a tower design. So you were yeah. supposed to stick a, a tower computer on a shag carpet out in your living room with a bunch of freaking okay. wires coming out. I of remember. The back do you remember? Do you remember how they justify that? No. They said your subwoofer sits on the floor. Oh come on! My, yeah. Microsoft had reference designs of uh, media center PCs that looked like stereo equipment. They would go into the stereo, you know, compartment in your wall where you had the hole with all the stereo stuff in it, and that was the point. They they wanted it to look like that. And instead, what you had was a big honking tower sitting out next to your, at the time, which was like a, a the, you know, the uh, rear projection TV that was like four feet deep sitting in the middle of your den. And it was just ugly. It was bad. And eventually, PC makers caught on. They always do. I mean, yeah. by the end of the run of Media Center, there were like nice Media Center PCs that looked like stereos. Uh, it, and by the way, HP made such a PC. They made a beautiful stereo looking PC late, late in Media Center's life. Um, so windows eight was a big bet for Microsoft and they, before they knew it was going to fail, you know, they wanted to do something to prop it up and, uh, they knew PC makers weren't going to do it. So would, would they green lighted a project to do it themselves. Do you think it would have been a, 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 I think it would have been a failure regardless, but do you think it would have been this big of a failure if the PC makers were making the devices that they're making now? I don't know. I mean, I, I, right. You know, it, it, right. So if PC makers had shown up on day one with like touch devices, uh, they, and stuff they just showed them. up with whatever, everything that they have today, you know, they, I think they, Windows A was too much of a compromise for that to have made a difference. And it was, you know, even though the, uh, the experience was better on touch devices than it was, it was still so incomplete and there were still so few apps um, that it probably wouldn't have mattered. But I, I, you know, that's like saying if you could have found Hitler when he was a kid. Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> you know, you know why I say that because I, I, I almost every Windows eight device that I have or I purchase was a non-touch device. Yeah, and your experience was very different using a touch device or a non-touch device with Windows eight. Um, I, I was never a fan of Windows eight at all, even on a touch device. But it was still a better, it was a better experience on a touch device than it was on not a touch device. So. I don't I don't know how much of a difference it would have made, but I think there would have been, you know, the perception wouldn't have been as negative for a lot of people. I don't know. You know, I, I can't. Windows 8 was a, a horrible mistake, so it's kind of hard to say. I mean, and we always do, you know, we could play that game. Like, what if they'd released Windows 10 first, you know? Um, Windows 10, if they could have somehow done that back then, which they couldn't have, combined with uh, awesome two-in-one computers, which didn't exist at the time, uh yeah, maybe that you know that. You know what? If, if would have Paul, been kind of awesome. I guess. I, I'm willing to bet that if we, if Windows 10 came out before Windows 8, right, with with before the the UI, yeah, the sure. you know the discussion we'd be having right now. You know, it'd be great, Paul, if you could have this touch interface on this laptop here, and just have, just have that, and just have that, and just touch get rid around. of the desktop. And, yeah, get rid of the desktop. <laughs> well, by the way, uh, if they had done that, we might still be talking about those plans because that's what Microsoft wanted to do. Yeah. I, I I think that would have been the discussion we're all having right now about how we want a touch. You know what? The Surface would be the best device for that. We would have been talking about how it's missing this and we want it to be dockable and we, the, the same discussion we've been having for years. I just think, that, you know, it's perception. It's it's 90% of it is is what you think you're going to experience. Let's get psychological here on the show. What do people really want, Paul? <laughs> what do they really want? Um, did we talk about the, the band last week? I know a lot of people wanted us to talk about it and I don't think we did. I don't, but we can. Yeah. Let's talk about the band. Um, I got a bunch of emails saying like, Hey, you guys missed the band. Um, I found, what is that sound? Sounds like a leak somewhere. Jeez. It's a UFO. This entire house is crumbling. Finally. Yeah. Finally. They're taking me back to my planet. Um, Let's talk about the band because there was yep. one feature that I thought was really cool, and everybody poo pooed on it. Okay, when I kept bringing this up. So uh, you want to you want to touch on some of the changes? What? What's well, tell me what the one feature is. Uh, the 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 uh, oxygen intake. Oh, I don't even know what that is. The O2 reading. <laughs> so it, yeah, it measures the, uh, your your O2 levels. How does it do that? I so here here's my theory on this. <laughs> I don't I don't remember this. So that Oxygen. was that was the that was the big sensor. That was the the whole thing where it does your O2 levels. Really? Yeah. I okay. Yeah. 
And I think the way that it does it is that it guesses based on your heart rate. I, uh, right. I mean, I guess it's not measuring oxygen intake. It's, it's estimating. It it's estimating. It, it, everything is an estimate. They, they, I, I think okay. everything that they're, they're doing is an estimate. But even your heart rate is an estimate, right? Uh, it's not 100% accurate. It's, it's well, it, it's enough. not right. It's not sitting there measuring your heart rate. Yeah. But that was like the sensor that they added. What, how many sensors? It's like 11 sensors. There's 11 sensors. Okay. So. There were 10 in the previous version. The, the one new sensor is a barometer. Um, but they've also made another change where the um, uh, the UV sensor is now always on. So it's it's on the, you know, it's yeah. before you had to manually measure. So, okay, the VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen your body can take in at one time during exercise. For serious athletes like me, <laughs> this measurement tells yeah. them a lot about their <laughs> overall fitness level. It helps them trade for big events like marathons and triathlons. This is from Ars Technica, by the way. It says, well, you can attempt to calculate this for yourself. It's usually measured professionally using a treadmill and oxygen intake equipment. Yeah, wow. I, I, kinda, I think I kind of lost on this one. I didn't yeah. really pay attention to that. So okay. I, don't, I don't know. It's two forty nine. dollars It's a little pricey. You know, I thought it was too, um, except... When you could, like, in other words, I should look this up before I say it, but if you look, like, go to Fitbit.com, right? And the most expensive, like, the really nice Fitbit, which is what, like, a Charge HR? Is that the right device? Oh, actually, they have a bigger one that's kind of a watch kind of thing. Um, I guess that's a Surge. So, a, a Charge HR or a Surge, um, those devices are, two, that's 250 bucks. Okay. You know? And this is, in many ways, a more powerful device than a, a Fitbit Surge. Um, it is probably a little bulkier just because of the sensors, right, and the battery. Um, but I, I mean, it's, I would argue it's probably pretty comparable. Uh, and then a Charge HR. Do you make a Charge HR? Oh, Charge HR is actually one fifty, so you could save a lot of money doing that. But then you have the tiny screen, right? I mean, I think the. The thing about the band is, A, it does all this fitness stuff. It does sleep tracking, which you can do with Fitbit, at least the higher-end ones. It does uh, heart rate, which you can do with the more expensive Fitbits as well. But it also does the interaction with online services. So yeah. you can do uh, you know, a calendar, uh, messaging, phone, email, uh, Facebook, Twitter, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I end up turning all that stuff off, <laughs> you know, but it's it's kind of interesting. Um yeah, as someone in the chat said, uh, two forty nine is not an impulse. It's not in the impulse buy territory, but it is competitive. Yeah, uh, I think it is too. And you know, by the way, the lowest Apple Watch is uh, three forty nine. Yeah. So and the average selling price of an Apple Watch is seven hundred bucks. So Don't here's um, here's some more information in the chat room by Bruce. Uh, in summary, the Microsoft Band does not directly measure VO two max. Instead, it measures your heart rate, resting, walking maximum, to estimate its quantity. So it's not really measured. So that's actually baloney. It's not good. I take. That's oh, just an estimate, right? Yeah. So I, Ra uh, Raphael sent me a link to a something called pulse oximetry. Ex oximetry. Oximetry. It's basically a uh, a device that you know you put the thing over your finger, and you got a little wrist thing, thing on your wrist that measures your saturation of oxygen. Yeah. That's actually so it's kind of doing the same thing. SpO two, but yeah, it's just an estimate, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, it's an estimate like uh, Apple Watch has to do about everything because Apple has no sensors in there. <laughs> just, just guesses. Everything's it's a wild guess. It, try, it, try, it tries. It, it tries. Um, can we talk? No, I forget. Never mind. I'm not going to mention it. Okay. Not, not mentioning it. Forgot it. I was going to bring something up. Mm -hmm. um, do we have a date? People are asking. Do we have uh, an idea of when the next uh, major wave is coming? Next what? Uh, next major wave of what? I'm guessing they mean threshold. Threshold two. Oh Wave no! I mean, two. it was originally October. I think we can all agree it's not happening yeah. in October. Well, it was supposed uh, to be this week. Oh yeah, I don't, I, right. I'm not sure. I knew of an exact date, but um, I've heard November now. I mean, honestly, you know, July first is basically August first. I mean, uh, July thirty first is basically August first. You get uh, September, October, November is three months to quarter. Um, I think quarterly is roughly the right time frame for these releases it's microsoft they never tend to hit dates it's the first one too so obviously they want to get it right um i would say sometime in the next 30 45 days uh that's good 
you know, for threshold is and it, also for Windows 10 Mobile too, right? I mean, they got to finish that. So is it going to be what they had anticipated was going to be originally with the release of Threshold 2, or are they taking some stuff out? It's not everything. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that they've still they've pushed back. And I think this, again, this is the type of thing we're going to see because in addition to stuff that just isn't ready yet, we're also seeing them add stuff that maybe they didn't anticipate, and it's based on feedback. So you put Windows 8, uh, Windows 10 out into the world, millions of people provide you with feedback, and you say, you know what? Maybe we should implement colored title bars or whatever goofy little things people want, and things get pushed back. And so uh, I had expected that, for example, with this Threshold 2 release, which originally was coming this week or this month, that they would have the add-in model in Edge implemented. Yeah. They don't. They don't even have uh, like syncing favorites in Edge, which is a crazy basic feature. Uh, and hopefully that stuff shows up. Um, it looks like the new Skype stuff is going to show up there. They've been testing that for the past couple builds. So this threshold wave, the threshold two, is not as big of a deal that as Redstone will probably be, right? Yeah, I, I yeah. I mean, I, I I am not as up on the Redstone stuff. Um, I the way I look at Redstone is it's like the Windows ten plus one. Yeah, yeah. That know, that's yeah. It's like one year eight eight, eight I mean, one. So. Yeah, I, I, you know, it, look, I, they're going to sort of have these quarterly releases. And by sort of, I mean, we'll see how that really goes. You know, um, some of them will be bigger than others. And then there'll be that plus one release. And, you know, the plus one releases for next year's back to school season, next year's holiday season, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. All right, Paul. <laughs> Let's wrap it up. Uh, go to our website, gfknetwork.com. You can catch us there. We're everywhere. Podcasts are available. Subscribe to us. Uh, go to our website. If you're watching live, stay tuned. We're going to do a bonus show here. We have a throwback Tuesday. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit more chit-chat here after uh, we're done recording. If you're listening to the podcast, you could get this show. You could get the bonus show on Patreon. Patreon.com slash what the tech. Go there, fund it, and get access to the bonus shows. Therat.com, all things Paul Therat over there. Uh, Paul, uh, you have a book coming up, huh? I do. What's the, what, what, what is this book about? What Are we, are we doing a fiction? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a book about Windows 10. Yeah. Um, it, sorry, yeah, sort of a, a little bit of fiction there. No, I, you know, we've had some setbacks because of uh, we had signed up to do LeanPub, which is a really neat looking online publishing thing. Part of the reason is that, um, you know, we just don't want to have to handle the financial end of it. It's such a pain in the ass to have to do that. And uh, they do do that. And so, I, you know, right up to the end of July, I thought, okay, I got, I got like half the book done or whatever the, you know, point was. And uh, we'll put this up on LeadPub and off to Europe I go. And then you look at it and you realize they don't really work with uh, Microsoft Word. They work with Markdown. And uh, their converter is garbage and it doesn't work. And now what? <laughs> you know? So we had that little bit of a problem. And um we worked through that, and now I'm working. We converted the whole book over to Markdown, um, so that's been very interesting. And I've been working in Markdown and, and trying to figure out the publishing system that they have up on the site. And so at this point, we have now figured out both uh, Markdown as well as Markdown Pad, the editor, as well as Lean Pub, the publishing system. We have. We're gonna, I, I don't want to talk about this in the podcast because when I do announce this later, probably this week, there are some cool extras we're going to be giving out with the book that I think people will like. And um, so it's been longer than I would have liked, but it is uh, really happening, I promise. So this week, we're going to hear something. I think so, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I feel that pretty good wonderful. about it. It's still not wait. done, by the way, but it's about 400 pages long. Wow, that's a lot. It's a PDF. That's a big book. Yeah, the pictures are big. Yeah. Big pictures. I like It's all pictures. The whole it's book. Just, it's pretty <laughs> much, yeah. It's, it's a picture book. <laughs> it's a different approach to publishing, I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I can you make it a pop? I, can you make it a pop-up book? It's a. <laughs> I would love that. Just one page. You know what? I'll think about that for the next one. That's just amazing. one page. Just make it a pop-up. It's, it's just, just like, like the little kitten going like. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't have to do anything with what you're talking yeah. about. Just just have yep. a random pop-up, like like a dinosaur comes up. Right. She open it up. It's it's a chapter on. Uh, I know. don't know if um, Lean Pub supports that kind of publication, but I'll look into that. That's kind of cool. I will love a pop-up book. <laughs> a Paul Thorat children's book would be nice yeah. also. Yeah, <laughs> why you should never buy an my children's iPad. book is going to be called Europe sucks. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Here's why. Here's why. 
Uh, Paul Therat, everything, uh, go to therat.com. Follow him uh, in, at Therat. Also does a phenomenal podcast, Windows Weekly, every Wednesday on the Twit Network with Mary Jo Foley. My buddy, my drinking buddy, Mary Jo Foley. We hang out without you now, Paul. You know, I've been trying to reach her all day today, and I finally realized uh, she's traveling. That's why I can't find her. <laughs> Is she not here? I think she's going she... to England, right? Doesn't she? She's going to Manchester or something? Oh, yeah. She's not here this week. Yeah. I completely forgot about that. So I it's just so me and you. Yeah, it's no. just me and you hanging out. Yep. 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 Uh, that's going to be fun. It'll be alone time for us. Be nice. Be great. Nice. All right, guys. Uh, go to our website, uh, and uh, we'll see you all next, next time, I guess. Whenever. We'll see you sometime. Later.